it seems to me that there is everywhere an attempt at present to divert attention from the actual influence which Kant exercised on German philosophy, and especially to ignore prudently the value which he set upon himself. Kant was first and foremost proud of his table of categories. With it in his hand, he said, This is the most difficult thing that could ever be undertaken on behalf of metaphysics. Let us only understand this could be. He was proud of having discovered a new faculty in man, the faculty of synthetic judgment a priori, granting that he deceived himself in this matter. The development and rapid flourishing of German philosophy depended nevertheless on his pride, and on the eager rivalry of the younger generation to discover, if possible, something, at all events, new faculties, of which to be still prouder. But let us reflect for a moment. It is high time to do so. How are synthetic judgments a priori possible? Kant ask himself, asks himself, and what is really his answer? By means of a means, faculty. But, unfortunately, not in the five words, but so circumstantially, imposingly, and with such display of German profundity and verbal flourishes, that one altogether loses sight of the comical niaiserie allemande involved in such an answer. People were beside themselves with delight over this new faculty, and the jubilation reached, reached its climax when Kant further discovered a moral faculty in man, for at that time Germans were still moral, not yet dabbling in the politics of hard fact. Then came the honeymoon of German philosophy. All the young theologians of the Tübingen, Tübingen institution went immediately into the groves, all seeking for faculties. And what did they not find in that innocent, rich, and still youthful period of the German spirit, to which romanticism the malicious fairy piped and sang? and one could not yet distinguish, distinguish between finding and inventing. Above all, a faculty for the transcendental, Schelling christened it, intellectual intuition, and thereby gratified the most earnest longings of the naturally pious inclined Germans. One can do no greater wrong to the whole of this exuberant and eccentric movement, which was really youthfulness, notwithstanding that it distinguished itself so boldly in hoary and senile conceptions than to take it seriously, or even treat it with moral indignation. Enough, however. The world grew older, and the dream vanished. A time came when people rubbed their foreheads, and they still rub them today. People had been dreaming, and, first and foremost, old Kant. By means of a means, faculty, he had said, or at least meant to say, but is that an answer, an explanation, or is it not rather merely a repetition of the question? How does opium induce sleep? By means of a means, faculty. Namely, the virtus domitua, replies the doctor in Moliere. Cia est in eo virtus domitua, cuius est natura sensus asupire. But such replies belong to the realm of comedy and it is high time to replace the Kantian question, how are synthetic judgments a priori possible, by another question, why is belief in such judgments necessary? In effect, it is high time that we should understand that such judgments must be believed to be true for the sake of the preservation of creatures like ourselves, though they still might naturally be false judgments, or more plainly spoken, and roughly, readily, Synthetic judgments a priori should not be possible at all. We have no right to them. In our mouths they are nothing but false judgments. Only, of course, the belief in their truth is necessary, as plausible belief and ocular evidence belonging to the perspective view of life. And finally, to call to mind the enormous influence which German philosophy, I hope you understand its right to inverted commas, goose feet, has exercised throughout the whole of Europe. There is no doubt that a certain virtus domitiua has a share in it. Thanks to German philosophy, it was a delight to the noble idlers, the virtuous, the mystics, the artistes, the three-fourths Christians, and the political obscurantists of all nations, to find an antidote to the still overwhelming sensualism which overflowed from the last century into this, in short, sensus asupire. As regards materialistic atomism, it is one of the best refuted theories that have been advanced. 
and Europe, there is now perhaps no one in the learned world so unscholarly as to attach serious signification to it, except for convenient everyday use, as an abbreviation of the means of expression, thanks chiefly to the Pole Boscovich. He and the Pole Copernicus have hitherto been the greatest and most successful opponents of ocular evidence. For while Copernicus has persuaded us to believe, contrary to all the senses, that the earth does not stand fast, Boscovich has taught us to abjure the belief in the last thing that stood fast of the earth, the belief in substance, in matter, in the earth residuum and particle atom. It is the greatest triumph over the senses that has hitherto been gained on earth. One must, however, go still further, and also declare war, relentless war to the knife, against the atomistic requirements, which still lead a dangerous afterlife in places where no one suspects, suspects them, like the more celebrated metaphysical requirements. One must also, above all, give the finishing stroke to that other and more portentous atomism, which Christianity has taught best and longest, soul atomism. Let it be permitted to designate by this expression the belief which regards the soul as something indestructible, eternal, indivisible, as a monad, as an atomon. This belief ought to be expelled from science. Between ourselves, it is not, it is not at all necessary to get rid of the soul thereby, and thus renounce one of the oldest and most venerated hypotheses, as happens frequently to the clumsiness of naturalists, who can hardly touch on the soul without immediately losing it. But the way is open for new acceptations and refinements of the soul hypothesis, and such conceptions as mortal soul, and soul of subjective multiplicity, and soul as structure of the instincts and passions, want henceforth to have legitimate rights in science, in that the new psychologist is about to put an end to the superstitions which have hitherto flourished with almost tropical luxuriance around the idea of the soul, he is really, as it were, thrusting himself into a new desert and a new distrust. It is possible that the older psychologists had a merrier and more comfortable time of it. Eventually, however, he finds that precisely thereby he is also condemned to invent, and who knows, perhaps, to discover the new. It is perhaps just dawning on five or six minds that natural philosophy is only a world exposition and world arrangement, according to us, if I may say so, and not a world explanation. But in so far as it is based on belief in the senses, it is regarded as more, and for a long time to come must be regarded as more, namely as an explanation. It has eyes and fingers of its own, it has ocular evidence and palpableness of its own. This operates fascinatingly, persuasively, and convincingly upon an age with fundamentally plebeian tastes. In fact, it follows instinctively the canon of truth of eternal popular sensualism. What is clear? What is explained? Only that which can be seen and felt. One must pursue every problem thus far. Obversely, however, the charm of the Platonic mode of thought, which was an aristocratic mode, consisted precisely in resistance to obvious sense evidence, perhaps among men who enjoyed even stronger and more fastidious senses than our contemporaries, but who knew how to find a higher triumph in remaining masters of them, and this by means of pale, cold, grey conceptional networks which they threw over the motley whirl of the senses, the mob of the senses, as Plato said. In this overcoming of the world, an interpreting of the world in the manner of Plato, there was an enjoyment different from that which the physicists of today offer us, and likewise the Darwinists and the anti-teleologists among the physi phys physiological workers, with their principle of the smallest possible effort and the greatest possible blunder. Where there is nothing more to see or to grasp, there is also nothing more for men to do. That is certainly an imperative different from the Platonic one, but it may notwithstanding be the right imperative for a hardy, laborious race of machinists and bridge builders of the future who have nothing but rough work to perform. To study physiology with a clear conscience, one must insist on the fact that the sense organs are not phenomena in the sense of the idealistic philosophy, as such they certainly could not be causes. Sensualism, therefore, at least as a regulative hypothesis, if not as heuristic principle. What? And others say even that the external world is the work of our organs. But then our body, as part of this external world, will be the work of our organs. 
but then our organs themselves would, the, would be the work of our organs. It seems to me that this is complete reductio ad absurdum. If the concept causa sui is something fundamentally absurd, consequently the external world is not the work of our organs.